is one, the one framework that you need to build a full stack React web application and a React native application all in one go? Let's find out. So I spent the better part of a week trying out one, building apps, testing out features, and unlike the coding walkthroughs I usually do, Instead, I'm gonna give you the kind of review I might do if I was, say, a principal at a big company looking to try out a new framework and then recommend it to my peers and showing off the features and doing them and some pros and cons at the end. So let's start off with setup. It's really easy. You use MPX1 to set up an app and your choices are between a bare bones setup with or without Tamagui and a full stack example. If you want to try it out, I'd go with the full stack example because it's got most of what you're going to need. It's got Tamagui, which is a cross-platform UI toolkit, which is also from the same folks behind the one framework itself, as well as Drizzle and Postgres for database work and Biome for tooling like linting and all that. The Tamagui component library is clearly one of the critical pieces here because whatever you choose for the UI, you're going to need to have it be cross-platform so it works across both React for Web and React Native, and Tamagui is a top-tier component system for doing that. Now, for my simple photos application, I started with that full-stack starter, and I stripped it back so that instead of using Postgres and Drizzle, I instead use a file-based storage system. I did that basically to simplify it for you if you wanted to try out my code. To use the Postgres stuff, you follow the instructions in the README for that full-stack app, and it goes through how to use Docker Compose to bring up a Postgres instance, if you got Docker installed, it's pretty easy to do that, but I just want to go with that file system anyway. The one full stack template installs Postgres because the Postgres database is behind this real-time database API called Zero that I think soft partnering with. Now, the documentation on the one site says the Zero stuff is really cool, but it's also in private beta. So if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments, and I'll reach out and see if they can give me an early look, and we'll have a look at it. So when it comes to developing on this, to install it, you're just going to use yarn install and then use yarn dev. That's going to bring up this interactive mode where you use OW in there. Just type OW to bring up the web view and then QR to bring up the expo QR code if you're going to look at it in native. Now you could just point your phone at that QR code or if you want to do it locally, I use the simulator and I bring up expo in that simulator. I type in the URL of the app but instead of Using HTTP, I use EXP instead as the protocol, and then I just give it 127.001 colon 8081. All right, let's have a quick look at this Photos app that I built. Of course, all of the code for that is available to you for free in the link in the description right down below. The homepage for both web and mobile shows all the uploaded photos that you upload, and then you can click on a photo and go to a detail page on it. You can also upload a photo using a file picker on the web or a camera on mobile. And there's this static about page. So I'm just trying to try out all the different types of routes and UIs. So let's have a look at the project over in cursor. And you can see that all the routes are defined over in the app folder. There's also some additional non-routing code, shared code located in the code folder. You can change that to source if you want to. I don't particularly like the word code in this case. I wouldn't do source, but code is what you'll get if you do the full stack starter. So there's the config folder, and it just holds the Tamagui config. We'll take a look at that more in detail in a bit. There's also a public folder, which has the public assets in my app. There's also an uploads folder inside of that where the uploaded pictures go. And there's also a photos JSON file with my files-based database as opposed to that Postgres stuff. There's just a few more things on the top level. There's an app.json that has the expo configuration for the native app. There's a biome.json that defines like linting and formatting specifications. And then there's a React Native config, which has the setup for VXRN. Now, VXRN is a critical piece of the infrastructure here. So one is built on top of Vite, and VXRN is the bridge from Vite to React Native land and gives you a platform for both web and React Native from the same code base. So if you're looking for that shared code base idea, but you don't think that one has quite the right, right structure for you, then maybe you could use VXRN as a starting point and build whatever you want to on top of that. And then they got a TS config for TypeScript. It's the usual stuff, although they do add a path for tilde, which gets you to the top of the project so you can use that in your imports. 
And then for the vconfig, we bring in both one and the Tamagui configurations. Now notable here is the default render mode, which is set to SSG or static site generation, which means that by default, all of the routes in your app will be compiled and cached at build time. But we'll get into that when you talk about routing. In the meantime, I hope you're enjoying this new faster format. If you are, let me know in the comments. And speaking of fast, if you want to get into React Native super fast, you should check out this week's partner, Infinite Red. Infinite Red is the OG React Native consultancy. They are React Native experts, and they've been an integral part of the React Native community from the very start. And they work with some of the biggest brands out there, Domino's, Mercari, Zoom, Zoom Care, and many more. These companies trust their expertise with React Native, and I do too. Whenever I get a question about React Native, I hit up my friends over to Infinite Red, and they've always helped me work through my issues, and they can do the same for you. Infinite Red's also super active in the community. Each year, they run a Chain React conference right here in Portland, Oregon. I had the honor of speaking there last year about how to use React Native with AI, and not only did they help me get that app running, they also have an open source AI for React Native project that they sponsor, as well as the OSS Ignite framework that makes it super easy to scaffold out your React Native app. So if you're looking for a React Native consultancy, look no further than my friends over at Infinite Red. Thank you guys so much for supporting this channel. All right, let's talk about routing. Now, before I get into the specific mechanics, it's important to know that this is not a web app running in a web view on native. One handles web routing and building pages for web, and on mobile, it's doing the native routing and the native rendering using React Native. That's why you need something like Tamagui as well, because you want that one set of component primitives that work across web and native. All right, so one is a file-based router, which means that the organization of the files and the folders in that app directory defines the structure of the routes. For example, the about.tsx file at the top level here is slash about on web. If you click on a photo, you go to the details page for it. So that's slash photo slash ID, and that's in this photos route group. And then within that, photo as a folder, and then within that, the brackets ID that indicates a parameterized route. Now, there's also plus SSR, which we'll get to in a second. So the structure of the files and the folders in that directory is the structure of the routes. And this isn't really anything unusual. Next.js, Remix, Tanstack Router, they all support file-based routing, but of course, they use different syntaxes for it. This one's actually very similar to Next.js. So now we know how stuff is laid out. Let's talk about the different types of routes that one supports. There is the default, which is a static route, and that gets built at build time and is fixed. In my app, the Photos app, the only page that's static is the About page. Then there's a server-side rendered route or SSR route. That's a route that's rendered dynamically on each request, and you specify that using plus SSR as part of the file name on the route. The home page, for example, which is inside that photos route group is SSR'd, so it has that plus SSR. Every time you request home, it goes and gets the photos and it renders out a new page. Now the route group thing with the parentheses is a little weird. The first time I saw this was with the Next.js app router. Basically, a route group is an organizational way to hold a bunch of related routes together, but the route group name itself, in this case, photos, in this case, doesn't appear in the URL. So you might think with this structure, you get slash photos, slash photo, but it's just slash photo. So moving on, there's SPA or SPA or single page application pages. In this case, our upload page is a SPA page. Now these pages aren't server side rendered, they're only client side rendered. So for an upload form, it just makes sense for it to be a SPA page. And then finally, there's API routes. In this case, the upload handler that's called from the upload page when you upload a new image is an API route. For an API route, you export functions that match the HTTP method names. Like in this case, an all uppercase post will get you a post handler. And then you get a request as input and you do whatever processing you want to do. In this case, I'm storing the uploaded file. And at the end, you return whatever JSON you want to send back. This is actually a pretty popular way of doing API routes now. And I, I, I like it. 
For React routes, so SSR, SSG, and SPA routes, the module for that page needs to return a default export, and that's going to be the rendering component, like my about route here that just returns a component that has the about page in it. There's also specially named components like this underscore layout that wraps the routes. You can see that the top level layout that includes the metadata when you're in web mode. So this is web flag and your code is a way to include or exclude code specifically for web or native. That's just one way to do it. That layout also has providers in it. In this case, Tamagui and theme providers. So layouts can also be nested. So in this case, in that photos group, for either the home page or the photo details route, then the layout that's in there will be nested inside of the parent layout at the top level. All right, so that's routing with one. Let's talk about how to do data loading because when you render a page, we're gonna want some data probably to render. So let's have a look over at the about page. It's an SSG route because that's the default and we haven't specified a type and it has a loader function in it. Now that loader function in this case is run at build time. And it sends back this little bit of data back to the component that uses the use loader hook to get access to that data. Now let's check out the SSR route for the home page. Here we're loading all of the photos, in this case from a file, but you could do it from a database if you want, and then passing them on to the page through that use loader. And then on the photo details page, we get the ID parameter, which is specified in the file name in the loader function. And then we use that to load the data for the specific photo. And then we send that along to the page for rendering again through use loader. So this loader architecture is pretty standard for these full stack frameworks. It's in TanStack, Remix, the Next.js pages router, but it's unlike the Next.js app router that uses React server components or RSCs to load and render the data. I actually think that's going to be a big differentiating feature between these frameworks coming up. Some that are doing the loader stuff and others that are doing the RSC stuff. All right, now let's talk about components and responsive layout. My recommendation in this case is if you're going to use one, then use Tamagui for the components. It's clearly the component library from the framework creator, and it comes pre-installed if you request that. And it's also cross-platform between React Native and React Web. And honestly, it, it's a good component set. It's got pretty much everything you're gonna need. It's got buttons, inputs, labels, dialogues, toasts, all that stuff. Plus it's themable, so if you don't like the look, you can change it. So for cross-platform layout, Tamagui supports three different components. There's X-Stack, Y-Stack, and Z-Stack. X-Stack and Y-Stack are basically the ones that you'll be using most often. So on the web, XStack is a flexbox in row mode, and YStack is a flexbox in column mode, and that's emulated over in native to give you the exact same layout. You can also use Tailwind style shorthand, like MT for margin top or PX for padding on the left and right side. In this case, we're using attributes instead of class names. You can also have platform specific styles by using the dollar platform attribute. So here we're using dollar platform native and saying that on native, we want 100 pixels of padding on the top. You can also use iOS and Android in there if you wanna be really specific about what platform you want. The default in this case would be web. One more thing, you can also add custom breakpoints. So I added small, medium, and large to my Tamagui configuration. And then over on the home page, you can see where I set the cards to 50% width at the medium breakpoint and that actually works on both web and native. So you get that nice wrapping effect. Finally, sometimes you're gonna want native only code and code that is just for iOS or Android. And one has a really elegant solution for that. Let's look over my camera component. Here I've got two files. So we get index.tsx, that's the web version and the default. And then also index.native.tsx and that's for native. Of course, you could also use .iOS and .android if you wanted to be very specific about it. The important part is that the exported components need to have the same signature. So I put these two files side by side, you can see that the default exported component, in this case, camera button, has the same signature across both the web and the native versions. Then over on the import side, I just import it as I usually would, and one automatically handles switching between which is built for which bundle. Now this matches the standard for React Native, but the one folks have actually ported this over to this Vite setup. All right, so now that we know more about one, let's talk about some pros and cons. And I'll first start off with the cons. And I think the biggest one is, at this point, 
stability. It's, it's a pretty early beta for this. So I got to say, it's, it's still pretty shaky. So if you buy in, you got to be ready for some pretty choppy going, at least at first. The other con for me is that not all libraries are compatible with this. And you can see what I mean when you run Yarn Dev. It's actually right at the top there, patching a bunch of libraries to get them to play nice with one. And that includes big libraries like React and React DOM and Vite and Rollup. And what that means is that it's actually going in and tweaking the code in those libraries to get them to work with one. And you can imagine that if that doesn't happen, then one doesn't work. So that's a problem. Now, for what it's worth, I was working with the One Framework folks as I developed this video, and Expo Camera, which is what I needed in my app, is in there specifically because I used that library and I was running into issues with it, and so they fixed it. So as you're trying out new libraries, you might run into issues like that and need that kind of patching. Now, the good news is that the team is really super responsive and they'll get those fixes done. Now, on the pro side, there is a lot to like about One. It's, it's genuinely delivering on the promise of React. When we first got React Native, one code base to build for both web and mobile was the ideal, and here it is. And it's not just shared state management or API layers. I mean, it's the full app. And I got to tell you, it feels more fluid to develop than what I would have thought. I was really worried that it would feel clunky, but it, it genuinely doesn't. Also, importantly, One doesn't paint you into any architectural corners. Tamagui, the underlying component library, is compatible with Next and with stock React Native applications. So you could take that code that you write in One, and if it doesn't work for you, you could refactor that into a mono repo with shared libraries and use that code in a Next app with Tamagui and then a React Native app, and that would all work fine. So I was building a startup and I had just myself or a very small team and I wanted to quickly put together a full web and native experience. I'd be looking really seriously at one. It's got everything you need. I also think it would make a great proof of concept framework when you're working at larger companies and you just want to show an idea, but also have it working everywhere. All right. I hope you enjoyed looking at this awesome new one framework. Let me know in the comments right down below if you're going to give this a try. Of course, a huge thank you again to this week's sponsor, Infinite Red. And if you don't know already, we have our own podcast now, Front End Fire. There's a link in the description right down below. Every week, me and my co-host TJ Van Toll and Paige Niederinghouse break down the week's top front end stories. We've got a weekly game and we talk about the cool stuff making us happy every week. It's super fun. Come over and check it out. Also, if you're into full-stack development, check out my new course on Next.js, pro nextjs.dev. I go into depths with the app writer that you will see in no other course. In the meantime, if you like this video, be sure to hit that like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell. And you'll be notified the next time a new blue-collar coder comes out.